absolute love. Part one, take two. <laughs> Welcome to Zoom Nation, guys. I apologize for the fact that I was speaking the first few minutes with my mute button on. And uh, a lot of you would probably say that's the most, that's the greatest expression of love I could have given you. And I'll start over. And I, I have never taught love before. I've never taught this subject. It probably, if I confess, the most difficult subject I have ever taught. I've never taught love because I have never truly realized it. I could define it and tell you that God loves us beyond all of our understanding. I saw love as a decision between an appropriate and an inappropriate act or words. But it's not. Love is a decision of identity. Absolute love is a decision of identity, and it's an identity that I have not fully realized. More often than not, I chose my fears over my identity of love and my self-sufficiency and stubbornness over realization. I have spoken with the tongues of men and of angels. I have prophesied, and I know and am learning the mystery hidden before the ages. But when I am not love, I am nothing. In my desire to be meaningful and important, I have only succeeded in becoming insignificant. It would be justice if only I was affected. But decisions not made from the identity of love splatters everyone around us. Everyone near me now has to live with the memories and hurt of every decision that I did not make within the identity of love. Words not spoken from love are very hard to forget. The search for love, as in everything we do, begins with trying to define that in which we are searching. In scope, we believe love can range from the smallest act of selfless kindness to the surrendering of one's life for another. It's probably one of the most difficult words to actually define. With today's lexographers using abstract words like feelings and emotions, we'll see those. It may very well be the most used theme in all of the arts, but I have concluded that love is not of this dimension. Love cannot be touched, it can't be seen, heard, it can't be smelled, or it can't be tasted. And therein lies our problem with love. We try to understand it and define it with our three-dimensional minds and our three-dimensional understanding. We try to wrap our minds around love, and it cannot be done. Because love is fourth-dimensional. That makes love spiritual. Everything spiritual is absolute and eternal. Everything in this temporal world is temporary and relative. Again, everything in this world is temporary and relative. How can it not be? The root word for temporal is temporary. It is defined as relating to earthly life and a sequence of time or a particular time frame. Meaning temporal has a beginning and an end. How can you not conclude that love is spiritual? That love is fourth dimensional and that love is absolute. We are told by John that God is love 
And Paul writes that love never fails. Love never ends. Love is both spiritual and eternal. I'm going to teach today on love from an understanding that you have probably never heard. An understanding that comes from the realization of spiritual sonship. From the reality of being spiritually birthed as a spiritual son of God with his identity and essence. But first, let's just look at how the world defines love. Love is a noun, and this is by Merriam-Webster. Definition of love, and I've highlighted some of the words that I want to further define. First, it is a strong affection for another out of kinship, kinship or personal ties. It's an attraction based on sexual desire, affection, again, the word affection, and tenderness felt by lovers. Third, affection based on admiration, benevolence, or common interest. Fourth, the assurance of affection. So we now have to figure out what affection means because it is used four times in all four different definitions. So let's look up affection. It is also a noun. Affection is a feeling of liking or caring for someone or something. It's a tender attachment, a fondness. It is a moderate feeling or emotion. So an affection is now a feeling or emotion. So let's define feeling and emotion. Let's break this down to its very essence in the definition. Feeling. See emotion. Emotion. See feeling. I'm not lying to you. That's really what it says. Now, see emotion, but feeling is defined by the word emotion, and emotion is defined by the word feeling. When the definition of love is broken down to its smallest components, we are left chasing our tails in a do loop of abstract terms, emotion and feeling. Emotions and feelings are but mere expressions of love. They are to love what the rustling leaves and the waves of the water are to the wind, expressions of that which are both unseen and intangible. <clears throat> As I just defined, love is an abstract, relative term that depends on your situation, your perception, and an individual's relation to you. It is a feeling that has limitations, restrictions, exceptions, and is qualified. We see love as an appropriate or inappropriate decision that we make. Love becomes what we do and what we say, not who we are. In this dimension, in this definition, Love is about what we do, not about who we are. If love is truly an emotion or a feeling, it will never, it can never be absolute, and it can never be for certain. It will always have boundaries, always have limits, and always have conditions. It will always be about us and our justifications. In fact, love is such a difficult word to wrap your mind around that Greek philosophy has defined six different concepts of love based on an individual it is directed toward, based on the relationship with us, to us. <laughs> this, when I was doing this, I thought six, I thought there were three. Agape, eros, philios. And I, I, I remembered a, I remembered a uh, comedy routine by Robin Williams. 
And I can see two Greek philosophers sitting around. And he says, there's agape, there's eros, and there's philios. And the other side says, good. We've got three definitions of love. And he goes, no, I've got six. <laughs> it's like the Greeks have a definition for everybody in your life. It doesn't matter. You listen to these six definitions. If it, somebody is in your life, the Greeks have defined a word for it. First, agape is the love of God for man or man for a good God, as defined. Eros, sexual passion. Philio, friendship. So we have God, our wife, and our friends. But we have three more that most of us really don't know. Storge, that's the love between parents and children. Philosia, that's self-love. That's love for yourself. You don't want to, don't want to exclude ourselves in Greek philosophy. And zin, zinia, which is a Greek concept of hospitality. The generosity and courtesy shown to those who are far away from home and on associates. So the Greek definitions of love are what Bible scholars and Christians have made the standards by which all things are defined. But those definitions that I just read are still abstract and relative. Greek philosophy only further defines love as to whom our feelings and emotions are directed. We believe that when we know the six Greek words for love, that we now understand love. We do not, because love is spiritual. You can know all six of those. You can teach on every one of them. You can define them. You can say them. But that doesn't mean you understand love. Love is spiritual. And herein lies the problem for the, both the Greek and the English definitions. Love is not abstract. Love is not relative. Love is absolute. Love does not depend on our situation, perception, or the individual's relationship with us. Love is absolute because love is a person. An absolute person. In truth, there are only two types of love, according to my definition. The first, <clears throat> absolute love. The second, temporal love. Temporal love is concerned with this present life. It is transitory and temporary. It has boundaries. It has conditions and justifications. It is three-dimensional, and it is not eternal. Temporal love exists within the boundaries of what we do or we do not do. It exists within an identity that we can control. However, absolute love is the identity of God the Father. Simply, love is a person. Absolute love is God's fullness and the context in which he has done all things. It has no limitations, no conditions, no exceptions, and no qualifications. If God is love, then absolute love becomes a decision of identity. Every spiritual son has the Father's essence and identity of love. Absolute love is the context and means by which God has done all things. It is the context in which his purpose 
can be understood and received. Every spiritual birth son of God is absolute love. Listen, every spiritually birth son of the Father is absolute love. Because as John writes, as he is, so also are we in this world. The problem is that we do not understand spiritual birth. And because we do not understand spiritual birth, we do not know our identity. Every human being is worthy of God's unconditional and absolute love. Because he so loved the world that before the foundations of time, he gave his only begotten son. Christ would become the spiritual seed and love of the Father by which every spiritual son would be birthed and identified. The Spirit of God is consistent in both his words and his revelation if absolute love is truly spiritual and fourth dimensional, then we should see that consistency in the words of Paul. And we do. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. <clears throat> Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, absolute identity, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, which is width, the length, the height and depth, the fullness. And to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Absolute love is measured by Paul in four dimensions. Breadth, length, height, and depth. In this world... All things that exist in time, space, and matter can be defined in only three dimensions. But the love and fullness of God require a spiritual fourth dimension. Depth. Fullness. If I took a glass, if I took a square container, I could define that with three dimensions. But when I fill it, that is a fourth dimension, fullness. And that is the Father. Furthermore, Paul is telling us that the only spiritual, that only the spiritual inner man can realize the absolute, can realize the absolute love and identity of God the Father. The love of God cannot be realized outside the spiritual birth. It can be received by all, but only realized by his spiritual sons. God has the need to give, and we were created to receive. But once we are spiritually born again, we likewise become givers and initiators of that absolute love. We love absolutely because he first loved us. His love is perfected in us because as he is love, so are we in this world. It sounds profound, it's, but it's simply the magnificent revelation of the Father to John in 1 John 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is 
love. But this, the love of God, by this, the love of God was manifested. It was made visible and clear, made known. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through, that is because of, by reason of, him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect, mature, mature, full-grown love casts out fear. We could substitute that word perfect for mature. There is no fear in love, but mature love casts out fear. That fear is what drives us to panic and to flee God. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. First John chapter 4 is without a doubt one of the critical chapters in understanding and realizing our identity as spiritually birthed sons of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, And he says, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Paul further tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 that if we do not have love, we are nothing. Furthermore, John tells us that perfect and absolute love casts out fear. Mature love casts out fear because there is no fear in mature, perfect love. Why? Because fear involves punishment. Living in fear outside of the realization of perfect love causes us to live outside of our spiritual identity. Living in fear outside of the realization of perfect love, of absolute love, causes us to live outside of our spiritual identity. We live in the identity of of a straw man, our straw man. What do I mean by that? Let's define straw man theory. The straw man theory is a pseudo pseudo legal theory that holds that an individual has two identities, one of himself 
and the other a separate legal identity who is the straw man. The idea is that an individual's debts, liabilities, taxes, and legal responsibilities belong to the straw man rather than the physical individual who ran up those obligations, conveniently allowing one to escape their debts and responsibilities. Does this sound remotely spiritual to you? An individual who lives two identities. One, his true identity as the spiritual son of God, and the other, an identity created under the law and in bondage to the flesh. You are comfortable within the false identity of your straw man because it is an identity in which you maintain control. It is an identity in which love is what you do and not who you are. It is a comfortable identity, but you cannot live within both, for they are at enmity one with another. You live within your straw man identity because you are ignorant of your spiritually birthed new identity. The straw man of the law and flesh is the one condemned, and religion is the prison in which he lives. The straw man of the law and flesh that you live in is the one condemned, and religion is the prison in which you live. Within this prison of religion, you are the one tasked with rehabilitation of the straw man. Religion tells you that there are no options outside of change and conformity. If you want parole, that straw man will have to change his bad behavior and conform to the good. But let me tell you, people, parole will never happen. You will always be a repeat offender. That straw man will always be in the prison of religion. <clears throat> there is no exchange. There is no transformation in this prison of religion. Just the works of the law and flesh. However, the new identity of the spiritual son of God has no condemnation and lives free of the penalty of sin and death. You live in this bondage of fear of punishment because you have not realized the perfect and absolute of love of your father. His perfect love casts out all your fear and sets you free. You don't understand. The spiritual birth has provided you a way of escape from this prison, this prison of religion. And that escape is a new identity. A new identity offered to you through the cross and the absolute perfect love of God the Father. Realizing this absolute love of the Father and the new identity of a spiritually birthed son gives you the confidence to live without fear and allows you to become complete and mature. For you will never mature as a spiritual son until you resolve this conflict of identities. You will never realize completeness when you live both identities. Again, you cannot live within both identities, for they are at enmity with one another. And yes, there's a conflict going on. There's a war taking place. It's the war of those two identities. I once thought that the straw man needed to, to surrender to God. 
I've even said that. I need to surrender. But the Father told me that surrender was not lasting. That a person can surrender and yet be resentful. I then offered the straw man to the Father out of obedience. I thought that was a higher motive. And yet he said again, there is there's a higher motive than obedience. He said there's a motive that is eternal. Absolute love. A decision of absolute love. The Father desires your straw man be drained of his blood on the sacrifice altar of identity, not because of surrender or obedience, but because of the absolute identity of love. You can surrender and obey and still not love, but you cannot love without surrender or obedience. For if you love him, you will obey him. In absolute identity, there is a complete surrender. You surrender all things to the Father because you love him. And you possess this love not of yourself, but because he first loved you and gave you his son. In this love, you have a complete trust and peace. I want to continue discussing the straw man identity, but I'm going to pull back at the moment and save that in-depth discussion for part two in three weeks. To continue, absolute love is a decision of identity. Absolute love is a decision that we make about identity. You go through each day constantly making decisions of identity. Each choice you face challenges your fears, your insecurities, and your ambitions. Your fears of not being important, not being recognized, not being respected, drives decisions you make every day. You make decisions that promotes yourself over others. Fear allows you to delight when others fail. Fear drives your insecurities and your need to be right. Fear drives your need to win. Absolute love is a decision that we make before we open our mouth. The, the, the identity in which you live determines decisions of love that you will make. Do you choose to live from the condemned identity of the straw man? Or do you choose to live within your true spiritual identity as the son of God? That decision of love and identity was in the mind of Paul as he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want to read the entire chapter. Water break. Half time. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Does not take into an account a wrong suffered. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. 
Love endures all things. Love never fails. But if there is the gift of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there's knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Now listen closely for 11 through 13. When I was a child, that word child means infant, simple-minded, immature person, as David would say, ignorant. An infant, simple-minded, immature person. When I was a child, when I was an infant, I used to speak like an infant, think like an infant, reason like an infant. But when I became a man, when I became mature, I did away. I abolished. I separated from. I separated from childish things. For now we see in a mere dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. We remember 1 Corinthians 13 for verses 4 through 10. But I want to focus on 11 through 13. Therein lies the choice and decision of identity. Paul tells us in verse 4 through 10 that absolute and perfect love is not only a decision, but he tells us in verse 11 that it is a decision between our two identities. Will you choose the straw man of the law and flesh that is imprisoned in religion? Or will you choose your inner spiritual man? The straw man of the flesh can only speak, think, and reason like an infant. Infants cannot make decisions of love, nor can they initiate love. Infants are only able to receive. They cannot give. Likewise, you cannot initiate absolute love from your third-dimensional identity of the flesh. You're an infant. Absolute love is a person, and absolute love can only be realized from the same identity as that person, the person of God the Father. Paul tells us that when he became a man, he abolished and separated himself and rendered inoperative childish things. That infant. He put the identity of that child behind him. You want a clear definition of who that infant is? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 4. This will clear it up for you. And brethren, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men. I could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants. That's the same word, as to infants, as to children in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Have you not, I'm interjecting my words, have you not chosen that straw man? Have you not chosen to live in the infancy of your flesh? For since there is jealousy and strife among you, you are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am a Paul, and another, I'm Apollos, are you not mere men? Those who live in the identity of their flesh are infants, are children. And they will never mature into a complete and perfect man. 
until they abolish, separate themselves, that identity. That is not something that naturally happens over time. It is a decision of identity that only you can make. We don't outgrow it. Well, I'll be a man someday. No. It's a decision that only you can make between those identities. In conclusion, I began this teaching with the admission that I have never fully realized absolute love. I teach what I know and what I hear my father speak, but I do not always fully realize what I teach at that moment. Let me use the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. I see my identity of absolute love dimly. I see my identity of absolute love dimly. And I only know that identity in part. I see it dimly and know it in part because my straw man stands before me as I put my childish and fleshly identity behind me when I separate myself from it, when I put the straw man behind me, I will see my true spiritual identity face to face. And I will know the Father fully, just as I have fully been known. For my spiritual identity is a person It is my Father God. And I, when I put that straw man behind me, I now see him face to face. And I see my true identity. No longer dimly. Because when that straw man stands before me and I see both identities, I cannot see through him to my Father. All I see is that identity separated and put behind me, I now see him face to face. And at that moment, when my union with him is resolved into oneness and that oneness melts into identity, I will then realize absolute love. The Father and I will be one and his identity will be fully mine and I also will be Absolute love. I pray that the eyes of our heart, the eyes of your heart, may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. Live as a spiritual son of God because that is who you are. Amen.